Let's address this idea that MMA fighters can't box or MMA coaches can't train boxers at all. Hey, it's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. Let's communicate here. This may be the exception and not the norm, but I'll tell you my story. There was a time when I was absolutely incompetent at boxing in every way. I knew nothing about it. That's how most people start out, right? That's how everybody starts out. Nobody's born boxing. Nobody's a born puncher, contrary to popular belief. But I went through this martial arts journey, if you will. My first martial art that I trained in was Taekwondo. And then I trained in Shotokan Karate, and Capoeira, and Kobudo, and Judo, and a Japanese Jiu-Jitsu style, and then Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I started competing professionally in American kickboxing, and then Muay Thai, and then the sport of mixed martial arts. And for a very long time, throughout all of these combat sports and martial arts experiences, I was completely ignorant of boxing. Even though in my first foray into professional fighting, which was a, a kickboxing match, I went in there with a guy who had an amateur boxing background and also a, I believe it was a black belt in um, some style of karate. And I'm, I go in there as a black belt in Taekwondo and with experience in all these other traditional martial arts, and I'm thinking... Okay, this seems like a pretty evenly matched fight. And this guy, even though he was a little shorter and a little lighter, he, uh, he touched me up with those gloves. Man, hit me like a hundred times in those three rounds of that kickboxing match. And it did not dawn on me then, probably because of personal pride and personal biases, how important and how effective boxing is in the context of other combat sports. And it wasn't until I came to China and I started working at a place called the Feiyi Tiger Muay Thai Kung Fu Club, not to be confused with Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand. And this was a good gym, had some dudes from Thailand training there, had some good boxing coaches, Western boxing coaches training there. And... Some of my coaches there, because it was like a coach's gym. There were often more coaches than, than students there. I was the MMA coach. There were Muay Thai coaches. There were several boxing coaches. And we helped each other out. We helped train each other because we weren't just coaches. We were also part of the fight team. And we would go out there and we would we'd fight at these various events across China. And I remember I had one event, this this fight way up in northern China, and um, I got outboxed by a kickboxer. It was a kickboxing match, but I got outboxed by a boxer. And so one of the coaches there, he's like, dude, here's what we need to do. We need to start a boxing camp for you. We're, we're going to start a boxing camp for you. So they, they got all the boxing coaches together. Man, bless their hearts. I'm eternally grateful for these guys for, for assembling this, this fight camp that they did. And for... Four months, all we did, every single day, multiple times a day, was boxing. And they were like, dude, if we can get your hands going, if we can get you to set up your kicks and your clinches and everything else you want to do with your punches, if we can get your boxing tight, we can change your game around. Somebody asked me just today, Ramsey, who... What would you have to do to beat your, your former self, your younger self, back when you were competing? As an older man, in your 40s, what would that be like? And I told him, look, man, young Ramsey sucked. Old Ramsey would beat him any way he wanted to. Any way he wanted to. And a lot of that is because of this, this boxing camp. Right, and so I started learning the ins and the outs of boxing and learning how to conduct that to, to everything else. And man, what, this was like 12 years ago, about 12 years ago. And this was my first real serious foray into boxing. And I was in my 30s at the time. 
And that's a pretty late start into boxing, even if you have all kinds of professional and amateur experience in other combat sports behind you, even if you've done kickboxing and Muay Thai and MMA and jiu-jitsu and wrestling and all this other stuff. Doesn't really matter because boxing is a different animal. Sort of. Sort of. But, man, I kept going. Kept going with the boxing. And I'll tell you why. Because MMA fights happened in China. But because it was a fledgling sport, it was much more common to find kickboxing and boxing matches in China as a professional fighter. So if you were a professional fighter in China, professional MMA fighter, you'd be doing an MMA fight maybe once every three or four fights. The other ones would, would be other types. It would be K1 matches, Sanda matches, Muay Thai matches, basically kickboxing matches or boxing matches. And then you'd have that MMA fight once in a while and they would usually jerk you around with the rules and uh, unless you knocked that other guy out cold, you would probably end up losing anyway. It's just how it was in China back then. Yeah, it was unfair. It was biased. A lot of fights were fixed, man. But, yeah, it was pretty easy to find striking matches, and so I started in investing a lot more heavily into striking. See, back when I left the United States, uh, MMA fights, the, the UFC in general, was making this transition from... Uh, it was still making that transition from jiu-jitsu is the end-all, be-all of MMA to, wait a minute, striking matters too to, hey, let's all become well-rounded mixed martial artists, to, these are kind of looking like um, kickboxing matches with little gloves. What's going on here? With a takedown once in a while. So, that, this was a very invaluable experience to me. Now, when I started coaching boxers, because the more you know about something, the more you start to see the holes in it. The more you start to see how to exploit it. And the more you know about the rule system, the more you know how to exploit those rules and win. So a number of years later, a number of years later, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, bless her heart, love her to death, invited some of my MMA fighters, amateur MMA fighters, to come and compete in an amateur boxing exhibition. And I think the idea was that, you know, these guys, they're not boxers. You know, they're tough, they train, but they're not boxers. And so we're going we're gonna to look really good against these guys. We're going to showcase, you know, I'm just guessing this was the intention because they invited six MMA fighters over to a boxing tournament. And I think the expectation was that we were going to lose and make them look good. And that did not happen. And we walked away with six victories, zero losses in that boxing tournament. So what happened there? Why did the MMA fighters win against the boxers who trained specifically and only for boxing? With a world champion boxer, mind you. How did some schmuck who started learning boxing in his 30s coach these guys to six consistent wins and zero losses in this tournament? Is it because I'm a great boxer or a better boxer than a world champion? No, no. It has nothing to do with that. Is it because I'm a better coach? That's arguable. That's arguable. But I'll tell you what it's about. It's because I brought six fighters to compete in that tournament. And what do fighters do? They fight. And they win. I remember as I was, as I was coaching my fighters to win these boxing matches. And I'm showing them these strategies that they can use that work as exceptionally well in amateur boxing matches, man. You gotta play the long game with pro boxing matches because there are more rounds, it's a lot longer. But amateur boxing matches, man, you get aggressive, you get in there quick, you get work done. And these strategies work really well. And I remember my fighters kept saying, wait, is this legal in boxing? And I'm like, 
Yes. Yes, it is. And they're surprised because a lot of people are surprised about what dirty boxing actually is. There are a lot of people out there on the internet, many of them have popular channels, talking about dirty boxing and they have no clue what they're even talking about. They don't know what dirty boxing is. Dirty boxing is a term that means holding and hitting. If you do that in a boxing match, the referee will make this signal. He will hold his wrist. He will give you a warning. Holding and hitting, that's the holding signal, that me, that's a foul. If you are holding or clinching while striking, that's dirty boxing. Now, sometimes the term gets thrown out there colloquially to mean anything that doesn't seem particularly nice or civil. But think about what sport you're in. It's a fight. You're hitting somebody, trying to do damage, trying to knock them out cold on the ground. There is nothing nice about that. It's so weird. We, we tend to divide up sportsmanlike behavior in a sport where the objective is to lay the other dude out flat. But in a sportsmanlike way, that's weird to me, man. But dirty boxing, once again, that is simply holding and striking. It's clinch fighting, basically. It does not mean hand fighting. It does not mean shoulder rolling, hip checking, knee bumping. It does not mean framing. It means holding and hitting. So all the aforementioned, that's perfectly legal and actually common in boxing amongst professional boxers who know what they're doing. Man, you watch really good boxers. You will see this stuff constantly, but sometimes you got to watch them in slow motion to see what they're doing. Arm drags to a strike, but you got to let go. Man, I got a whole video on this stuff. I got a bunch of videos on this stuff, but I don't call it dirty boxing. It's hand fighting. It's the kind of stuff that uh, Wing Chun nerds spend a lot of time almost exclusively doing this hand fighting stuff. And as long as you're not holding when the strike lands, you're good. If you tie up and then separate that clinch with a shoulder bump and then hit him, you're not holding him, you're not clinching. That temporary clinch was active. You will not get faulted by the referee. I had a, a student a while back, and I refed this match, and I don't like that I refed this match because it's a, it's a conflict of professional interest for a coach to referee his own fighter's match. But this was an amateur match over at this local club here in Shanghai called Punch Cage. I did an exhibition MMA fight there once, and I did some, some grappling matches there and so on. It's, it's a fun club. It's a fun club. So they got a big you know, fight cage in the middle, like UFC-style cage, and they host different types of events there. They do boxing matches, they do MMA fights, they do kickboxing matches, they do grappling tournaments. They do, they had armored, like, historical European martial arts night, night fights in there. You know, cool stuff. It's a, it's a fun club to go to. So shout out to the folks at Punch Cage for doing some solid events there. But they did, they did some boxing matches and I ended up refing these boxing matches there. And this, this happens a lot because when you... <laughs> In my position, I end up kind of accidentally becoming a boxing authority in Shanghai with no intention of becoming a boxing authority or a boxing coach or a boxing referee or a boxing expert of any type. I simply ended up being pushed into this role in a manner of speaking. So I'm roughing this match and... Uh, my student's opponent has this reputation of, you know, he's, he's raw, he's a big, strong dude, he likes to rough people up, he's not very technical, and he doesn't always abide by the rules. So, here's what happens. In fact, I'll, I'll show you this clip. I'll show you the video. So, my student, his name's Lynn, he goes out there, and he's a pretty big, tough guy, but he's got an injury in his shoulder. He threw out his shoulder prepping for this fight which is shocking, his left shoulder, because he knocked his opponent out with a left jab. So his opponent fouls him a couple of times. Not to the point where I need to disqualify him or even take away points, but I, I have to give him a warning, and I want to kick him out of there. I'm like, oh, you fouled my guy, you big jerk. But from the perspective of an objective referee, they were not flagrant fouls, so I had to simply give him a warning and say a repeating this action 
will result in the loss of a point. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. So finally, you know, things like hitting on the brake. Amateurs do that all the time, hitting on the brake. That's when the fighters tie up and the referee comes and separates them. And before the referee gives the signal to box, one fighter punches the other. In the, and uh, that's called hitting on the brake. That's a foul. And one big conundrum that you're going to have with uh, being a referee is enforcing the rules to the letter and making the promoter happy. I've had the experience as a referee of enforcing the rules to the letter and making promoters very unhappy because sometimes those fights end up stopping and some guy gets disqualified and the promoter's like, dude, that fight cost a lot of money. People wanted to see that play out. Just give them a warning next time. That's This sort of thing happens, man. And nobody wants to be the guy who is responsible for not giving the people what they pay for. This probably sounds horrible and rotten, but it's the fight business, man. It's the fight business. So I give the guy the warning. And I look over at Lynn. And, uh, you know, Lynn is calm and he's collected. Even though he's been fouled multiple times by this guy who is kind of milking the rules to get away with it. And... uh, the guy rushes in, Lin bah, pops him in the chin with this jab. The dude goes flying to the ground. I'm like, what was that even real? And afterwards, I was thinking, did this guy just take a fall? And I didn't really, and I was there in person with the, the closest seat in the house. And it wasn't until I watched the video replay like 10 times in a row when I realized what happened. It was just the cleanest, most well-timed jab. Because, man, my students pay attention. My students pay attention. Love those guys. Shout out to Lynn. Cool guy. So, where would we go in with this? The idea that if you have the label of MMA fighter or MMA coach or you're involved in the sport of mixed martial arts, you don't know anything about boxing. Dude, do you know how many boxing coaches, boxing coaches, very good boxing coaches are involved in the sport of mixed martial arts? A lot. A lot. Why? Because mixed martial arts is becoming mainstream now and boxing coaches are realizing, hey, there is crossover between these two sports. We can get involved. We can help these fighters excel more so than they already did in much the same way that my boxing coaches back at the Fei Tiger Club, you know, 12 years ago, realized this guy has so much untapped potential, both as a fighter and as a coach, that he doesn't already possess, but he could have if, if he had the solid understanding of boxing. So let's help him get that. And it's not as hard as you think. A lot of people want to mystify the sport of boxing. Now, I don't want to sell it short and say, anybody can do it. Anybody can just take a couple of years or a couple of months and train a little bit and suddenly master the sport of boxing. No, man, there are levels to the game. There are levels to the game, and I spar with pro boxers all the time, and uh, mm, man, there are guys who are so good, it's like, it's like magic, man. They're in front of you, suddenly they're behind you because they just disappeared, and you're like, what just happened? They hit you in places where you, you don't, you didn't, didn't even know you could get hit, man. There are levels to the game. Everybody's talking about the the Jake Paul versus Ben Askren match coming up. And a lot of people have been poo-pooing Ben Askren because he's not a boxer, because he's just done MMA and wrestling. and eh. He's not fighting Floyd Mayweather, guys. <laughs> this isn't Conor McGregor versus Floyd Mayweather. This is Ben Askren versus a guy who's been training for two years. How good can you get in two years? Well, it depends. It depends on what you put into it. It depends on who's helping you out, who your coaches are, you know, where you started out, what your physical gifts and aptitudes were going into it. It depends. But for most people, not that far. You can become a pretty decent amateur in two years. 
You can even become a decent, low-level, entry-level professional in two years if you're one of the upper echelon of uh, gifted athletes. But the idea that an already gifted athlete, albeit much older, with hip replacements and so on, is playing catch-up to a guy who has only been doing combat sports for two years total. That's kind of silly to me. I don't know who will win that match. We'll find out, but the arguments surrounding this match are silly. Objectively silly. Can you be an MMA fighter and a boxer? Yeah, a lot of people have been. There are many. I mean, go, go to Wikipedia, for example. There is a whole page, a very long list of names of fighters who were both professional boxers, successful professional boxers, with a winning professional boxing career, and also a successful mixed martial arts career. There's a long list of them. A lot of people also say, Ramsey, why don't we see more judo guys in MMA? There's a Wikipedia page on that too. Look that up. A long list of successful judoka who were also successful mixed martial artists. These are things that actually happen. Why? Because being good at one combat sport really does help you to be better at another combat sport. There is crossover. Remember, like, way back in the day, it was a really common practice in universities to send the football players, American football players, to ballet class. This happened at my university. The football players would come into the ballet class. I have a degree in dance, health and human performance, modern dance emphasis. I also have a degree in Spanish and fitness technology and exercise science. But my degree in modern dance, man, involved a lot of ballet training. About half of my classes were actually classical ballet. But the football players back in the old days, I don't know if they still do, but back in the old days would come and they would join the ballet classes sometimes because the coach, Lavelle Edwards, back when he was coaching at BYU, that's where I went, he would send some of his players to the ballet classes to make them better athletes because he understood something. There is crossover between these two athletic endeavors. And... This is an extreme example. Being light on your toes, gaining a greater kinesthetic awareness, greater kinesthetic intelligence through dance. It's a very different physical activity than tackling people on the football field. But back then, Brigham Young University was the number one football school in the nation, in the United States of America, as far as college football went. Now, I don't follow football. I've never been a big football fan. But... It was kind of fun to say, yeah, we're number one. And back then, back then my alma mater was number one in the nation. And you couldn't help but to think this guy, Lavelle Edwards, this coach, must know something about coaching. He must know something about athletic crossover between different physical activities. Now, if there is that much athletic crossover between ballet and American football, how much more crossover do you think there is between mixed martial arts and boxing? or boxing and mixed martial arts. Huh. I would venture to say a lot. All right, guys, thank you for watching. By the way, shout out to my sponsor, xmarshall.com. Go check them out. Use my code RAMSEY10 for 10% off everything on the website. They make excellent rash guards, sporting goods, combat sports stuff for all disciplines. Go check them out. Tell them Ramsey sent you. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and train.